2021 has probably been the longest year while also feeling like the shortest, with plenty of moments happening that even I forgot about. So many people and characters have gone through changes, and while some might be a little controversial, like Batman not wanting to appreciate Catwoman the way a man should in the Harley Quinn animated show because heroes don't do that, because you know DC pulled the scene, we figured that we should recap the biggest moments from all things DC this year. So. Let's do it. In at 10, the death of Bane. In a scene set in Arkham Asylum and Batman's Infinite Frontier number 0, we follow a guard named Mahoney as he performs a routine check on Bane, who is incarcerated in the Draconian facility. But things are anything but routine, as Mahoney discovers Bane chained up to the wall, as apparently he's expected to be, and then the room itself full of poison gas and dead guards. As this cop investigates, he discovers that Bane is not the perpetrator of the attack on the guards, but one of the victims. He pulls off Bane's mask to reveal that not only is Bane dead, but he's also been jokerized by the poison gas, which seems to be a version of the Joker gas. Thanks to this, Arkham goes into lockdown and the events which follow are known as A-Day or Arkham Day. Originally, the perpetrator of this horrific scene was assumed to be the Joker, thanks to the, you know, Jokerified Bane. However, the narrator is later revealed to be the Scarecrow, leading writers to assume that he's the one behind it. But recently, Batman has revealed that he doesn't think Scarecrow is behind it, leading readers to now question who truly comes. Day -day. I'm pretty sure it's been revealed, but like, I don't want to spoil it. And at 9, Bane Replacement. A deadly new villain also debuted in April 13th, the Joker number 2. One who is taking after her daddy. A new villain named Vengeance, the daughter of Bane. The latest in a long line of new characters introduced into the Bat family over the past year. Vengeance was even played up with a secret variant cover slipped into comic book stores shipments of Joker number 2 issues, with one copy of this variant for every 50 copies they ordered of the issue. And while I do question if this is truly Bane's daughter or the girl who goes around claiming to be everyone's daughter, like how she did when she was wearing the Joker's face claiming to be Joker's daughter, her taking over for Bane is certainly an interesting development, considering how Bane is largely considered to be one of Batman's best villains. However, I guess DC made it clear who they prefer, given that again, they kinda Jokerified him as, as soon as this new universe started. <laughs> More on that later. And it ain't the Snyder Cut. Zack Snyder's Justice League, often referred to as the Snyder Cut, is the 2021 director's cut of the 2017 Justice League film, the fifth film in the DC Extended Universe, the DCEU, and the sequel to Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, as director Zack Snyder intended it before he had to leave production. The theatrical version of Justice League received mixed reviews and was a box office disappointment, leading Warner Bros. to reevaluate the DCEU's future and led them to focus on developing films around individual characters with less regard for a shared narrative. Many fans expressed interest in an alternate cut more faithful to Snyder's original vision, which they and members of the cast and crew nicknamed the Snyder Cut. Warner Bros. decided to move ahead with it in February of 2020 after the internet was absolutely berating them, and in May, Snyder announced that the original cut would be released as Zack Snyder's Justice League via HBO Max. It cost around $70 million to complete the visual effects, score, and editing, with new material filmed in October of 2020, with some scenes even reportedly filmed in Zack's backyard after he was told that he couldn't refilm anything. Zack Snyder's Justice League was released on HBO Max in the United States on March 18, 2021, and became the fourth most streamed film to debut on the platform. It is so much better. I mean, it's four hours, but those four hours are used well. And it's seven, Batman Fear State. This event takes place within the Infinite Frontier era and is a prequel storyline that leads directly into the events of the DC Future State series that was released between January and February of 2021. Fear State derives its name from a paper that was written by Jonathan Crane while attending Gotham University. The paper laid out details on the benefits of fear-ridden society and major catastrophes, in that they eventually lead to inevitable societal and human evolution. The main plot revolves around Scarecrow and Simon Saint, who use each other's resources to attempt to acquire full control of Gotham City through fear. Scarecrow uses Saint for his means on gaining chemicals to make an upgraded and enhanced fear toxin to spread throughout Gotham City that adds an aspect of mind control within its victims, and after creating this toxin, Scarecrow eventually breaks away from Saint and the magic magistrate to wreak havoc on the city alone, and turns the citizens of Gotham against the magistrate. Whereas Saint uses Scarecrow and his fear state ideology to eventually cause a final Gotham crisis, in which the end result is Gotham City surrendering full police and military authoritarian control to the magistrate, establishing a permanent police state. This event spans 27 issues of various stories. So pretty big. In its 6th reverse Flashpoint. The Flash Armageddon was a 5 part crossover taking place in the first 5 episodes of The Flash Season 8. However, 
However, in episode 4, spoiler alert, it's revealed that Eobard Thawne, who looks like Wells again but is using his real name, created his own version of Flashpoint, where thanks to the new negative still force, instead of killing Barry's mother, he kills Barry as a child as he set out to do so many years ago. Or I guess technically Will set out to do. Man, time travel, bro. Anyway, he kills Barry as a child and then takes his place at CCPD the night the accelerator exploded, resulting in him becoming the Flash. And as this episode takes place, one night away from marrying Iris West. Yeah, so basically, Thawne changed the timeline so that he was actually the Flash. No imitation, no fake outs, no lies, he was truly the Flash in this timeline. And Barry was the reverse Flash, even connected to the negative speed force and having the classic red lightning and yellow suit. As Damien Dark said, that is a work of evil art. Then in the following episode, Thawne ends up asking the team to save his life since now the timeline has finally caught up with him because Barry went back and erased all the anomalies from the timeline using the time stone that Damien had. And Damien Dark also gets a moment with his daughter that almost made me cry. Although it, it's unclear if the lightning strike that hits Eobard in this timeline line is the original one from 2020 or the one that he made happen in 2013. Halfway through in number 5, Tim Drake comes out. Tim is at least the third of at least four men to wear the green and red tights alongside the Cape Crusader of Batman, but with Batman's son taking the mantle in recent years, he has undergone somewhat of an identity crisis. But in the storyline of Sums of Our Parts, he reconnected with an old friend, Bernard Dowd, who last appeared in comics in 2005. When the story starts, Tim's feelings for Bernard seem more than friendly. Seeing him for dinner, Tim thinks it feels like it's been years, but he still looks before the pair hug. First of all, it has been years, Tim, okay? It's been like 16 years to be exact. Perhaps not in the world of DC, but for us it's been ages, so maybe a little backstory before you drool over your bestie, please. Joking aside, Bernard is then kidnapped by the chaos monster in the middle of dinner, and Bernard hints during their escape, after Robin saves him, that he knows Tim is Robin, saying that he wishes they could have finished their date. Oh, hold up. Backtrack for a second, okay? What's with the random bombshell in the middle of this escape? Like, how do you know he's Robin? When did you work that out? Can I get like a flashback sequence real quick, please? Either way, this then leads to Bernard asking Tim out again and Tim accepting in one of the biggest emotional roller coasters in the past year. <laughs> in comics, not in real life. That, it's a whole other can of worms. In it four, John Kent comes out. Man, this is a long way from pink kryptonite, isn't it? John Kent, first introduced in Convergent Superman number two, in 2015 came out as bisexual this year on November 9th in the pages of Superman, Son of Kal-El number 5. This was announced on October 11th, also known as National Coming Out Day, so it may not have been a surprise to readers, but it's certainly a landmark moment, with a character as high profile as Superman shattering previous stereotypes even more. This along with the August reveal of Tim Drake also coming out as bisexual is really great to expand representation and not alienate any readers, identifying as part of the LGBTQ plus community, and I love that. Other major LGBTQ plus characters include include Batwoman, Harley Quinn, Poison Ivy, and Alan Scott, the first Green Lantern. In this issue, John Kent's Superman finds comfort in Jay's arms after he's totally wrung out from trying to save the world. Which, according to Jim Lee, works out more since, quote, we can have John Kent exploring his identity in the comments, as well as John Kent learning the secrets of his family on TV on Superman and Lois. They coexist in their own worlds and times, and our fans get to enjoy both simultaneously. Getting close to the end of number 3, Dark Knights, Death Metal number 7. And in that issue and the issue before, we see Wonder Woman at her most powerful, in a godlike form that's even more powerful than a god. As the comic puts it, quote, she has been a god before, but at this moment, she's more. At this point, she has ascended past godhood and can see, like, all of time and all realities. She can see every Earth's timeline, and she faces off against the Batman who laughs in his most powerful form. This fight is so intense that they hit each other through time itself. Batman who laughs punches Diana all the way back to, like, the Jurassic period. Diana here is charged with anti-crisis energy, a connective force that links all of history and all lives as one story. Then she moves on to become one of the hands that created the multiverse in the first place. And going forward, now there's no walls and greater possibilities. She aids in recreating the multiverse in a story we see in the next issues, and the result is what we'll talk about in a moment. But the issue where the multiverse is remade, yeah, a pretty big moment to say the least. Penultimately, in a number two, Future State. Future State 
is the direct aftermath of the death metal number 7 ending, where Wonder Woman defeats the Batman who laughs and ascends to godhood. This series is comprised of 26 series, all with 1-4 to four issues, where the story is Wonder Woman looking into a possible future for the new universe, or omniverse as they call it, created by the hands as well as her after the destruction of the previous multiverse. This was again only a possible future, but allowed the writer some time to get the main continuity sorted, thanks to the COVID-19 situation and the cancellation of Generation Zero, which was the planned follow-up to Death Metal. Quote from Jim Lee, We had a lot of great ideas that we were floating around, and rather than dumping it all in one month and then renumbering the line and going for that really short-term spike in sales, we just naturally gravitated to the story ideas and concepts we love and building them into the ongoing mythology in a very organic way. End quote. And this whole event and ordeal received positive reviews overall, which is good to hear, since now all the characters from multiple universes seem to have merged into one, allowing all backstories to be canon while picking and choosing which aspects best fit the stories they're trying to tell, which is pretty damn genius if you ask me. Although, every version of Darkseid being one, that's freaky. And finally, in at number one, Infinite Frontier. Infinite Frontier is a relaunch by DC Comics of its entire line of ongoing monthly superhero comic book titles in 2021. It's the follow-up to the 2016 DC Rebirth launch, and the entire event received positive reviews. Infinite Frontier begins after the events of Dark Knight's Death Metal, Generations, and Future State, and the DC multiverse has now expanded into a larger omniverse, where everything is canon and it's still dealing with the repercussions of DC Rebirth. The new multiverse has now two opposite worlds that represent the metaverse and sustain the balance. One is the Else world, and the other is Earth Omega, where Darkseid is imprisoned. The new status quo is that all of DC's history counts when understanding a character's backstory and legacy, and history within the franchise is being emphasized by editorial mandate, with many characters now sharing the same code names. For example, Stephanie Brown and Cassandra Kane share the title of Batgirl, while Oracle reserves the right to also wear the Batgirl costume from time to time, etc. After the recreation of the Infinite Multiverse, and a look into the possible future of her universe, Wonder Woman, who has ascended after the defeat of the Batman Who Laughs, is offered a role by the Quintessence in return for saving the multiverse. However, she does not accept it, but this is still the current continuity and main DC universe for now, which makes that a pretty big deal. That's all the time we have for today, friends. Thank you all so much for watching. I have been and shall remain Connor Monroe, and I'll see you in another video.